Hello and welcome to another episode of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm your host this week, Troy Lightfoot. And with me, I have a very special guest, William Stridham. Hello, William. Hi, Troy. Uh, William, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, what do I do? I'm one of those Agile coaches. Okay, Uh, very good. I am bringing a little bit more the professional coaching into my work these days from both uh, individual and relationship coaching and see how we can apply at a team level. Okay, awesome. So I think today we're going to talk about uh, how to make change happen on Agile teams that are stuck. Um, So what do we mean mean by stuck? Yeah, when I... Let's talk about the Tuckman model there for a, for a minute. Okay. Um, and it's when teams get into that forming stage and they never get out of it. They don't get past politeness. They just get stuck there. Or even worse, they get through the politeness uh-huh. and they get to the forming stage and, um, or sorry, storming stage. Right. And there they keep arguing and they never get any work done. And then they get reformed because they're perceived as a bad team. Precisely, they right. move people around on it, and right. they move them back. That's <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so the never-ending cycle, right? And what about teams that are stuck at norming and can't get to performing? This uh, could also this could help them with that too. That's correct. Yeah, and it's to get them through. Once they get to norming stage, from that point, I normally say it's a couple of nudges, and you'll get them into the high-performing stage. Okay, very cool. So, so we have a model, uh, I believe it's called the Structured Dynamics for Dialogue, right? By That's David, correct. To yes. David Cantor. So where did you learn about this model, William? Uh, Marsha Acker introduced me to it. She had a course that was called Making Change Happen. Okay. And when she described it to me, it was all about how to get teams moving past that stuck point that they're in. Okay. Um, and it's work that David Cantor and... Uh, Cantor Institute over in the UK created this this model and also the training course that she used. Okay, very cool. So the model has got three levels to it. Uh, the first level is called the action mode. Okay. Um, it's also the short end for it is the Cantor four-player model. Okay. Even though it's longer than just action mode. Okay. Um, and in essence, I will cover that in a little bit. The next level is called the operating system. Mm -hmm. And it's the rules that you follow when you speak. So it's not really the organization that you work in, but it's your own value system. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where are you coming from? What do you value? And then it translates and comes out in your dialogue. Okay. And the last domain is called the communication domain. That one is what you focus on when you're talking about stuff in teams. Like if your propensity is in meanings um, or even in power, if there's something about affect, you may not talk about it. Okay. Um, and when we talk about affect, yeah, it's not effect as in the the U.S. people normally think it is. It's right. affect is in feelings and what does that mean to you? Okay. Okay. Uh, so you talk about um, meaning and power. So what do you mean by that exactly? So if we dissect the communication domain a little bit, what happens there is there's three main domains that David Cantor identified in dialogue. Okay. Uh, People that speak in power is people that's coming from that, as we say in the the agile world, the command control world. They are into, is the task done? They will tell people what to do. They're very commanding. So they're coming from that, that power, even though... People may not even report to them, but they're coming from a power base when they speak. People in meaning are looking at, literally, they will say, what does that stand for? Or what do you mean by that? They're Mm -hmm. looking for, how does this connect to their underlying value system? Right. People in affect, and a lot of people in the, the coaching world come from this side, they will talk more about, you know, emphasize trust on on the team, uh, what motivates them. And we talk about some people say, oh, it's the soft skills. It's really these people are trying to get to the point of harmony and are very 
tuned into people's emotional states. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so how about the, the four player model, the four player model, I think it's called, right? That's correct. So at the lowest level, that is when people talk, it's how they speak, not so much what they say, but how they go about doing it. In any dialogue, there's always four actions that can happen. The first one is called a move. It's normally when people are setting a direction in, in dialogue. Right. Um, normally when I teach this to teams, I go, let's, for example, say we're getting close to lunch and, you know, let's go have pizza. Right. That might be a move. Let's go have pizza. Okay. Then there's two things that can happen. They can be what we call a follow where somebody can say, yes, let's do that. So they will complete that action. The follow brings completeness to, to the dialogue mm -hmm. um, or moves it further. The other action that can happen is somebody can go and do what we call an oppose and go, not pizza, you know, right. so anything else but pizza. Right. <laughs> so, and that brings correction to dialogue. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Without that, people won't get to the next level or get better or get through something. So okay. it brings correction to the dialogue. Okay. And the last move is called a bystand. And that's where somebody will just make a neutral statement to add information to the dialogue. And they might go, uh, I'm hearing you guys are going to have pizza again. Hmm. Not for or against it, just adding more information to the, right. the dialogue. Okay. A lot of times that's, in a broader sense in communication on teams, it's it might be something that somebody notices that the other team members are missing or it's a blind spot to them. So okay. it's bringing information into the dialogue for them. Right. So why don't we talk about typical applications you see of this when it comes to agile teams or scrum teams, for instance, right? Um, what are the typical like meetings or events you feel like if that a scrum master should be looking looking out for, let's say a scrum master wants to coach a team, they want to get the team dynamics better, right? So any thoughts about specific, um, I mean, of course you can use this anytime, right? That's but true. there are specific events or meetings that you think really stand out when could, could really use this as a leverage? Yeah, for me, it's normally when there's any kind of collaboration happening. So during the daily standup, uh, sprint planning, backlog refinement, any of those meetings where the team are coming together to collaborate and talk about the work they're going to do. Um, I normally teach the whole team the model okay. because it's not just something that oh, only the scrum master need to know this. Right. Anybody on the team can, can use this and it's actually needed for all of them to be flexible with this model and how to, to use it. Okay. And what you want them to do is notice what we call the stuck patterns. Okay. So in that Cantor four player model where there's only those four actions, a move, a follow, an oppose, or a bystand, you want them, they don't have to code exactly what each person is saying. Right. Uh, there are people that's very advanced in this model and they can do that on the fly. Okay. Um, I'm more, you, you will, once you get comfortable with the model, you will notice when somebody puts a move out there and there's a lot of follows. Mm -hmm. uh, that's normally when a team is busy forming and we call that they in the politeness stage. Right. Are we ready to commit to this goal? You know, the sprint goal and everybody go, yes, we are. Let's give it a first of five. You know, and so they go on and nobody right. opposes. They, nothing of that is, is there. And right. whatever gets done, whatever move is put on the table, everybody is going to follow it. So that will show up if you translate that back to the Tuckman model, that's going to be in the forming stage. Right. Okay. Be people don't want to go and uh, have any conflict at that point. Right. Then once the team get to the point where as they progress, we know conflict will arise. And that's normally where the stuck patterns of what we call uh, point and counterpoint. Mm. And it sounds like a debate because it is. It's a right. move and an oppose. Okay. And another move comes on the table and immediately another oppose comes up. So it's like now you start getting, sometimes it turns into factions. Right. And all you want to do is, once again, there's only two moves on the table. The other two moves aren't there. Let's see how we can interject them. Right. Um, the other uh, stack patterns that will emerge is what we call serial moves. 
Right. It's one way the team goes into a meeting, they're busy doing, you know, backlog grooming, they groom a whole bunch of stories and you ask them, did any of them reach the definition of ready? And they go, no. <laughs> and it is probably because there was a whole bunch of moves put out there and right. they did a move and another move and another move and another move. Um, that also happens when you get people that work in random. They just move on to the next thing. They never complete what they're busy working with. Right, okay. The other one that's a little bit more, sometimes you've got a, it doesn't always show up in dialogue per se, but it's the way that people will say it or their body language that you've got to read. We call it the covert pose. Hmm. There's a move that's put out and it's either going to be a follow or buy stand but the oppose either happens a little bit later or it happens in their body language or tone of voice. Right. Where, you know, the CIO of the company says, we will all be agile. And the people mutter under their breaths, yeah, that's going to happen on Monday. You know, it's, <laughs> right. it's that kind of thing. So it's like this COVID oppose. It's like a lot of people don't pick up on it. But it's one where a lot of the undertones are there. Okay. And any of these where... The one thing that immediately moves it ahead or forward is if you can tell people, speak a bystand. What are you noticing? Right. And sometimes I've seen teams where they go, especially where a bunch of move and oppose is happening. People will say, I'm noticing that we've got a debate going on here. Or we are going in circles around these two points. Like just informational. They're not showing, saying which one is right or wrong or better or worse it's just this is what i'm noticing because right. immediately the people who's saying that also notice it and they will either change their stance from the point of view where they go do i need to defend this or what is good about what the other person is saying because that's where you want to get them you want them to start scaffolding on each other's ideas right so i was recently working with a scrum master actually you had you had taught me this model um about Six weeks ago or so. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So I was recently working with a scrum master on this, and um, I was trying to model how to do that by standard uh, for this person. And I noticed I was in a backlog refinement session, and I noticed that there would be always one person moving constantly, right? Particularly when they were doing their story point estimates, right? Ah. And they would move, right? The person, so that person would put a three, right? Another person would put an eight, okay? The person that was putting a three was just constantly moving on the way it should be, right? The person that was coming up with an eight was was basically just following, right? But wasn't really speaking up, okay? And then when they would speak up, they would they would raise a pretty legitimate concern, okay? Yeah. About testing, about something. And then it was just like the movers were like, oh, no, it's fine. It's a three. It's no big deal. We did something like this before. And they would move on every single time, right? So then I actually stood in and I said, I, I, while I was observing the meeting, I was thinking about this four-player model, right? Yeah. So then I just acted as a bystander. I just said, you know, I'm noticing that this person is, you know, bringing up a lot of issues, um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion about those issues, right? Um, and then I just didn't say anything and watched what happened, and it was pretty fascinating, right? Because then it was like that person kind of... I don't know, sat up in their chair and then started really talking and then people were listening. Now, what's funny is that I, then I noticed the covert opposition uh, because the mover now became a follower, but like under their breath, you can tell that they weren't happy, right? Yeah. So what's funny is like, this is going to take some time, I think, for teams to really get good at, you know? But that was just an observation from trying this model out recently. I, I um, That's something I noticed. And as a scrum master, that's a really good place to be to try to read the room, right? Yeah. And become a bystander when you realize probably there's no bystanders going on, right? What do you think about that approach? Uh, that's great. That's yeah. where we advocate that a lot of coaches do that. Or if there isn't a coach that whoever noticed that, right. start just speak what you're noticing. Because one of the secrets to bystand and people miss that is you can't think it. Because if you think it, that's great, but nobody else is going to notice it there. You've <laughs> right. got to speak the bystand. You've got to bring it into the room or right. into the conversation. Um, and it's the to me, that's the power of just making people aware of what's happening. Gotcha. Uh, and that's how you get them out of that, that's, and that stuck pattern. That's how they move out of it. Because once they become aware of it, 
because we get into it and we don't even notice it. We just do it. And yeah. then somebody else points it out to you. And that's what the bystand is in essence. It's pointing it out. Right. And immediately you will change. The one thing, and it's also you kind of alluding to that on, on that team, mm -hmm. you get people where we all have what we call our default propensity or our default action right. in the dialogue. Some people are movers. Some people are opposers. Right. Um, we joke around this because sometimes when there's conversations, especially during uh, refinement sessions, where there's always the one person that will, it's, sometimes it's like the lead developer or whoever, and mm -hmm. everybody looks at him. And then there's always the person where immediately once that's done, you can see the heads move already because they're waiting for the opposer to come up. And <laughs> what I tell people, what I sometimes tell those two people or challenge the team to do is say, when we start pointing the next round, right. the lead is going to put his card out last. Mm. Everybody is supposed to put it at the same time, but make that person go later so people don't follow him. Gotcha. And tell people whoever is going to oppose this, the opposer can oppose, but let that be the second oppose, not the first oppose. So somebody else get a chance to step into that space. So how do teams typically deal with that if you're telling them essentially how to interact this way? Right? Yeah. How, how, do, how do they typically respond to that? What I do here is I tell them we're going to overemphasize it for a little bit, not forever. Right. Because what you want to do is you want to get people to speak from all for the actions. Because once you get to them talking from a balance where you do a move, you do a pose, you do a follow, you do a bystand, and you don't just talk from your default the whole time, mm -hmm. where it's almost like people assign you a role. Right. We want you to step out of the role so you can be everything. Become right. T-shape in your dialogue. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, and and that then brings to what we call that moves you closer to what's called generative dialogue. Okay. That's the area what we call it's called inquiry because what and I mean that's what we want we want to unlock the creativity on the team. Hmm. Once people can speak their mind, right. Instead of holding back, they will speak that oppose or speak the oppose and the bystand but it's coming out and it's now the whole team has got that information instead of it just sitting in somebody's head. Awesome. Okay. Didn't you tell me about a scrum master or a coach, I can't remember, who had some like physical cards made up and you weren't allowed to use, so they had, you want to tell me that story? Yeah. So these are some of the techniques um, that, that I've heard people use over, you know, the last couple of months as I learned more about this model. Mm -hmm. It's one way and so it's artificial constructs that you're going to put in place right. where people aren't moving out of their, how can I put it, their default um, move or move, their action. Mm. They kind of get stuck in it. So let's say you have that person that's always doing the oppose. So you give them a little deck of cards. Uh -huh. And I normally you just, the shorthand we use is M, F, O, B for the, the different actions. Yeah. So if they do a, a bunch of opposes, you just give them one or two O's, which stands for the oppose. Right. And every time they speak, you want them to use one of their cards. And okay. when their O cards are up, they're going to left with M and F's and B's. And you tell them, well, think about how you're going to talk using one <laughs> of those cards. It challenged them a little right. bit. Um, it does put some artificial uh, constructs around the dialogue. So it's not as free flowing, but it it gets them out of that stuck pattern until they get comfortable in that new uncomfortable zone. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So specifically on the four player model, before we get to the, the next two levels, how do you typically introduce this to teams? Do you teach it like in a training session? Do you do a workshop or how, how do you typically teach the model? Uh, my preference normally is just the way the team have the, the stand up space. Mm -hmm. um, I use the four cards and I, put it on the ground um, and then we do what's called uh, sculpting of it where we get them to act out the the different actions okay uh, that's one way we do it another way is sometimes if there's a community of practice going on mm -hmm. much like we used six weeks ago where right. I've got a PowerPoint uh, with a couple of slides on it and then I talk them through it um, the big thing is at the end I get them to move over to 
taking it back to their teams and we talk about different ways that they can use it with their teams. Mm -hmm. um, and the one I do find, the cards is really helpful and I see a lot of people use that. It makes it tangible for them. Because what's, because we're talking about a, a model, something that's a theoretical, yeah. And once you put cards in their hands or cards on the floor, all right. of a sudden it becomes a thing and it becomes something that they can action. Gotcha. So why don't you walk us through? So let's say you're a scrum master, an agile coach, a team member, a manager, whoever's listening to this, right? You want to show up to the stand up. You have the cards you're going to put on the floor, right? How do you introduce it at the stand up? Is there a specific kind of question that you ask or how do you facilitate it the first time? So first, you've got to do a little bit of a teach around it. So I normally, there's four actions. Mm -hmm. What are the four actions? So once again, I go into the move. And like I said at the beginning, it initiates direction for the dialogue. Right. And that's the M. I put it down. Then I normally put on the other side, the opposite side of it, I put a pose. Okay. And I say that brings correction to it. Because a lot of people put negative connotation to a pose. Right. And I say, this actually, it's needed. If it's missing, you won't get to the right place with whatever you're building or doing or getting there. You've got to have a pose. And then on the other axis, uh, it forms an X. I put follow. Okay. Because that completes or moves ahead your action. And then the opposite side of that is called bystand. And okay. that's where you just bring information into the dialogue. Right. Okay. And then I said, now that I've explained it to you, think about what do you do most on this team when you guys talk about something? Right. And then I get them to go, they will either go and stand at the move or pose or follow or bystand. Okay. And it depends on the size of the team, but normally if it's a right-sized right agile team, there'll be one of them where there'll only be one person or sometimes there won't be anybody. Like on the let's say, uh, the follow, there's nobody there. Right. Then you go, so now that you guys notice that, how is this showing up in the conversations you're having? And you start mm. talking about that. Okay. And then you tell them how, how do you, and then I bring up normally the stuck uh, patterns mm -hmm. and I tell them about uh, the politeness, uh, which is a move with a bunch of follows, the point and counterpoint, which is move, oppose, move, oppose. And then I tell them about serial moving just like it says, it's a whole bunch of moves. We never get to the others. Right. Uh, all, and then the covert pose, which is a move with a follow. And then there's a pose that we put in parentheses. Right. So the pose is there, but it's kind of not spoken out directly. Or sometimes during the meeting, it's not spoken. But as soon as the team walks out, they say it or out in the hallway. Right. So the dialogue sometimes continue even after the meeting is done. Okay. Okay, that's cool. So any tips for doing this with distributed teams? So instead of putting it on the floor, if you've got a, a canvas or a, a space that you do it, mm -hmm. make up your little cards. Uh, let's, right. let's say you use Trello, create four cards on it, okay. and then get them to vote which is their action that they do. And then you can see which card will have the most votes or okay. if they can draw an X on it. Uh, right. You know. Yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah, that's, that's that sounds great. So. Okay, so why don't we talk about the next level? So the next level, let's see, we've spoken about the full player model, which was the lowest level. The next one is called the operating system. Okay. So the operating system is where people come from when they talk. What are their value systems? There are three of them. They're called closed, open, and random. Okay. Closed is people that hold on to hierarchy and tradition, and they believe that things are in place for a reason and we're going to keep following them so right the open set of folks are more into emphasize process participation and teamwork they are looking at ways to include others and have consensus whenever they make a decision they want to hear from everybody on the team um, they also are believers in everybody has got something they can contribute to the world Okay. Or to that team. Right. Um, my secret belief is that's where Agile came from. Everybody has got something they bring to the table. Okay. That yeah, um, makes sense. Yeah. The last one is called random. This is more people in the random propensity or in the, sorry, in the random operating system. 
they are more individualistic they are more creative that's where a lot of like entrepreneurs are in that space because they go why am i going to follow rules or why am i going to listen to what other people say i'm going to follow my own you know way right um and that's remember this is all in in the context of dialogue where we're talking about these so it's like when somebody talks and because they've always done it that way they're going to keep doing it that way somebody that's open want to hear from everybody on the team right somebody that's random and we normally joke we talk about oh they're squirreling again because right. one idea next idea next idea they don't finish a topic in dialogue they right. just move on they right. they they lose interest very fast in, okay in what we're talking about right. Um, the next two levels almost go hand in hand. So the one we just finished talking about, which was the operating system. Mm -hmm. And the other one is called the communication propensities. Okay. So this is the one about how do you speak? If you talk and the three areas here are called power, affect, and meaning. Right. So if you talk from power, you're pretty much telling people what to do. Right. Where are we on that task? Have you done that? There's no leeway here. It's like my way or the highway kind right. of uh, when they speak. Yeah. Um, people in meaning, are they looking for what does that mean? Why are we talking about this? What's underneath all of this? Right. Okay. That's where those people come from. The affect people, and this is more in the coaching world, I see a lot of this showing up. People here are really looking at the emotional side. They value individuals. Um, they also look at trust and motivation and they want to unlock that for people. Yeah, yeah that's, so. that's definitely true in the coaching realm, for sure. Um, yeah. so, so, so how does understanding this second and third level, um, do you think this is something that you introduce this to the team or is this more for the coaching side of it or how does this play into that first level of the four-player model? Yeah, the four player model is one that I normally use with teams. The next two levels, it depends on how interesting interested the teams are and how successful they are at using the four player model. Okay. Because at this point we it's getting you've got to be a little bit more invested in learning the model to actually apply this. Right. And also this is where a lot of times people will talk and they will we say they talk but they never hear each other. Uh-huh. Because if one person talks, say, in uh, closed power and another person is in random meaning, mm. they will talk right by each other on the same topic okay. and never hear each other. Because right. the one person will go, is this done? Why? What's happening? You know, right. and the other person will go, well, when I look at this, I was trying to figure out what was the meaning of all of this? And I don't know why you're telling me to do it because that's not within my skill sets, you know? Right. And so the people talk right by each other. They don't realize that the actual topic that they have at hand yet, one of them have got to move into the other's um, space on the dialogue. They've both got to speak from meaning. And it might be what sometimes will get interesting is if you get both people moving to closed power, Mm. you may end up with a, a, a huge debate, especially if it's a move oppose. Because mm. okay. those people are not going to sometimes give ground. Right. So, And that's where you talk about them butting heads. So, so what you need to learn is how to speak in the words that will resonate with them. Okay. And that's where you need to move to either affect or meaning. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to think through this from a coaching perspective, right? So... If you're kind of observing the behavior and realizing where people are at in the, obviously the first one is the easiest, right? The first level. Yeah. The second and third level is going to take probably a little more um, uh, observation. And so are you just doing kind of a mental assessment about where these people are, the individual people on the team are? And then once you do that assessment, what are your actionable items for you as a coach once you once you assess where different people are at naturally. So yeah, so first, yeah. as all change, it's got to happen with yourself first. Sure. So you've right. got to get to the point where you learn to become aware of in which domain and uh, operating system you're coming from. Okay. And that you need to be able to move out of one into the other. Okay. And that's where that adage that sometimes comes up for me when we go meet them where they at. Yep. 
Yeah. You need to meet them in a dialogue in their default domains and their operating system and their communication domain. So okay. a lot of times when you're going to work with a CEO, they might be in closed power. So it's going to be interesting. You've got to learn to be subtle in closed power so they hear you and what you're saying and what you're trying to bring across to them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sometimes on a team, they're not always going to be in closed power. So sometimes you'll have like open meaning. Mm -hmm. So then you need to be able to speak in open meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of meet them where they're at. Be a role model in your dialogue around how you speak to them so you can connect with them faster, quicker. And then once you've modeled that for them, then you can start a, you know, build the awareness. So teach them the, the next two levels. Right. And then see how can you help them or point out to them that I noticed in that, like teachable moments is what you're going to look for at that point. Sure. Um, somebody was talking in meaning, you were talking in power. So uh, you guys were talking cross model there. Mm -hmm. All these things are easier said than done. It takes a while and a lot of practice to get there. Sure. Um, I'm still honing my skills on a lot of the ones at level two and three to okay. get them to work smoother. But it's one of those where I, I'm at least at aware of it. Right. And now stretching to be, make that my new normal. So that's kind of like what I talk about when I do those responsibility process talks about honing your awareness, right? Same same idea. I think that's going to be another podcast topic, by the way. So in the future, okay. Nice. So good. we will cover that right now. So have you have you assessed where you're normally at on the second and third levels? Uh, I do. So part of that course I did with Marsha, that making yeah. change happen, yeah. is you actually do what's called your Cantor profile. Okay. And you answer a, a set of questions. Okay. And then based on the answers that you give and that snapshot in time, you right. get... What is your, what, as Cantor says, what's your default propensities? Mm. So what's your default um, action, um, your communication and systems, uh, op operating system that you work from? Okay. And that's the first point, because once you know where you're at, a lot of times when you go through that report, you go, ah, now I see that. That makes sense. Right. And it gives you degrees of it, because um, what you want to get to is, you don't want to be good at one of them. You want to get to the point where you can use all of them all the time. Okay. That's what you strive to do. Right. So it's uh, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even going to get into this parallel dynamics talk yet. But okay, <laughs> <laughs> yet another <laughs> so, podcast waiting right. for us. <laughs> but uh, it sounds similar concept there. Yes. Um, so how about um, open affect? What do you think about people that are? What do you? kind of people do you typically see an open affect um it's also well i'm kind of thinking back to the uh, spiral dynamics here which i shouldn't because that's yeah. not going to resonate with the audience yeah. um this will be people that are starting that are getting more mature and agile mm -hmm. where they get to the point where they figure out it's not individualistic it's a team sport right and it's teams that are now trying to get their emotional level to go up so that could be like teams that are in norming. Some people, you might start seeing that and that to get to performing, you need some folks with that kind of propensity, right? Oh, the affect, open yeah. affect. Um, so, so are you saying that, so I understand for the four player model that you need all of them right, in a team to be successful. That's correct. Do you need all of them on the second and third level, the level as well? Only if you want to be, as we, if you want to influence people. Okay. On a team level, if they pick one and they all work in one, right. great, because then they're not going to talk past each other. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So level one, you need all. Level two and three, you don't. Surely. Yeah. Okay. Just move them to one. Once you get them in one, um, and depends on where most of the people on the team are. Okay. Because it's one of those, if you only move one or two person people versus moving five or six people the other way, what's going to be easier? Sure. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so how about where did this model come from? I mean, nobody came for David Cantor, but where, yeah. how, did this, how did he come up with this? So David Cantor is a psychologist. And uh, when he was working, I don't know, I believe it was he was working on his uh, PhD. Mm -hmm. And part of it is he wanted to have people listen to people's conversations in high stakes. Mm. And so the hypothesis he came up for high stakes was, um, 
young married couple or recently married couples. Okay. Because, I mean, their marriage is at stake in their conversations. Right, right. <laughs> and this yeah. stuff happened back in the 50s and early 60s. So technology wasn't really advanced at that point. Right. They, the people that he got to, to agree to be part of his uh, research project was he was going to put, he literally put a tape recorder in every room in their house. Okay. He had a whole bunch of interns, of course, working for him. Right. So they would run over to the different houses and literally swap the tapes around when the <laughs> tapes have run out oh my. and put new tapes in. Right. And as they take the old tapes out, they would take it and sit and transcribe it. Mm -hmm. David literally read through all those transcripts and that's how he came up with what did he notice in the dialogue that came up. Right. And what amazes me till this day that there's only four actions. Wow. Okay. Any kind of dialogue, doesn't matter what they were talking about and even in the world now, it only comes back to there's those four actions. Right. <clears throat> and then... All this work kind of spilled over and he eventually wrote the book, um, Reading the Room. Right. And he explains this model in detail when you read that book. So I bought the book, haven't read it yet, but I'm doing this podcast now. So I think it's a good primer for the book as well. So I think when I read the book, I'll be, I'll be better at applying it, hopefully. It's a pretty big book, actually. I was surprised. Um, maybe I shouldn't be, but a lot of times now, a lot of books I buy, I notice they're... Two to three hundred pages, a lot of agile related books. And I don't think this is an agile related book, of course. No. Right. This would be pre agile. Right. Yeah. Um, but so it's going to be an interesting read um, and I'm pretty excited to get to it. I think it's like number two on my list right now to get to. So nice. It's um, moving towards the top. Yes. <laughs> I've been finishing about a uh, few books about, I don't know. Three books a month on average. So it'll be probably next month. I'll get to it. So. Um, where can people learn more about this, uh, aside from the book, of course? Okay, yeah. yeah. So there's the book. Yeah. Um, there's Making Change Happen yeah. that Marsha is doing through Team Catapult yeah. at teamcatapult.com. Okay. Uh, there's also the Cantor Institute, um, which it's a UK-based company. Um, they do have people that are doing some of the work over in the US. Um they did make a change. Uh, I think David is kind of changing his focus a little bit on what he's doing these days. Um, there's another company called Dialogic. Okay. When I took the course, Dialogic and the Cantor Institute were actually working together. Mm. Uh, but I think they've moved apart now and because they've got different focuses on where they want to take this work. Okay. Um, but I highly recommend taking the, the course from Marsha because it's not just reading the book. She does a really great job because there's two front of the room leaders. Mm. There's a lot of the practical application of it and also doing journaling through the whole process. Because a lot of this is you making changes in yourself and becoming aware of things. And my biggest thing was moving. I came from the, you know, the power dynamic and the, the closed power, uh, right. being a, a project manager for years and years. Right. And I got so averse to it. I don't want to go back there. It's like now. And but there is good in it and it is needed. So for right. me, my challenge now almost is going back and speaking from closed power. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. OK. Yeah. But I, I understand what you're saying. Right. I mean, there's different things are needed for different circumstances. Right? Precisely. So, yeah. Right. Sometimes it's needed. If there's a crisis and you in reaction mode, right. you want to speak from closed power. Right. Makes yeah. sense. Okay. Um, William, anything else you wanted to talk about or bring up? Well, people that's listened to this point, I just want to say thank you for stuck, sticking with us. And I hope you find a lot of use from this model. All right. Thank you very much.